Okay, Dr. Vishali Gupta, madam, please start your year. Then we will have slowly, we will discuss it along the post students. It's over to you, Dr. Vishali Gupta. Thank you very much, Dr. Subodhi, for the very kind invite. Thank you, Dr. Sarbisachi. Uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking when Dr. Babu invites, because uh, though I do have 950 invited lectures, but Dr. Babu was the first one who invited me as a speaker in LVP Hyderabad, and he has been a great mentor. Thank you, Dr. Babu, for all your kindness. So the topic that has been given to me, and I'm going to go slow, and all the postgraduates or anybody is welcome to interrupt me at any point of time during my talk. So the topic that has been given to me doctor, by Dr. Babu is posterior uveitis. And I understand that Dr. Biswas has already spoken to all of you about panuveitis in the last session. So when we talk of posterior uveitis, there are two things which are important. First is when you look into the eye, you make yourself accustomed with some of the terms and you should categorize what you are looking at. Is it retinitis? Is it choroiditis? Is it primarily retinitis and the choroid is involved secondarily, which is called retinochoroiditis? Or is it primarily choroiditis with involvement of outer retina, which is chorioretinitis? Or is it retinal vasculitis? Because all of them have different etiologies and it's very important that you know what you are dealing with. Once you know, what or which one of these phenotypes is present, the investigations and the further management will become easier for you. Then there are different investigations. Uh, one is the serology. Uh, we will come to it by large when patients come to us and Soumya is here, he would share with you all. And we have a panel they are carrying with them a whole lot of serologic investigations. Believe me, serology has no role in uveitis. So do not unnecessarily change any serological investigation except syphilis. You know, that is the only one which gives us some important information. Then there is imaging, and we do have multimodal imaging, fluorescein, autofluorescence, ICG, OCT, NGOCT, but it's again very important to know which imaging modality to use in which particular uveitis because you can't do everything for everybody. And also you should not feel discouraged that if you do not have OCT, NGO, or ICG, and somebody at the conference showed beautiful images, it does not mean you cannot diagnose because all you need is the clinical skills. Then there comes the role of radiology, which again, I'm going to discuss. And finally, the last things like vitrectomies for diagnostic, which is only for very few cases. So let's move on first to the phenotype. Now, why is the pattern recognition important? Because once you know what you are dealing with, this is the key to develop a list of differential diagnosis. Once you have differential diagnosis, you will get only very tailored investigations and you do not need a whole lot of investigation. So these are the six things which you should look for when you are looking at a patient of posterior uveitis. First, as I mentioned, is it choroiditis or is it retinitis? Is the lesion focal or diffuse? Then you pay attention to the vitreous. Is there associated vitreitis or interior segment inflammation? Is the disease purely confined to the eye or is it a part of systemic disease? And for this, you will need to talk to the patient, get history, look at many other general physical examination. 
After that, you look at the imaging. And when the patient is healing, you also have to pay attention to healing pattern because that might tell you about the possible etiology. We come to the second leg, investigations and how do they help. Serology, as I mentioned, is mostly corroborative. It is very indirect evidence and mostly it is not reliable except for conditions like syphilis. When we talk of imaging, again, uh, we have a lot of things, but the imaging should be customized. And when you are doing imaging, you should know what you are going to look at. And I'm going to show you example of all of these. Radiology, you do when you are suspecting something in the systemic focus, or in cases of TB, we do get CT chest from everybody we are suspecting of TB. And finally, the pars plana vitrectomy, including choroidal biopsy, that is if either you are suspecting the mass graves, our lymphomas, or your patients are not responding and it is an atypical etiology. Now let's go to stepwise approach. How do you go in posterior uveitis? So first, what is the first step? As I said, the first step is you see whether it is retinitis or choroiditis. Now when you do the clinical examination, uh, the retinitis will have a yellowish white, fluffy. You will see the vessels running within this yellow lesion. The margins would be blurred and indistinct. It could be focal, like you see here, or it could be diffuse, like you are seeing on this side. So if it is focal retinitis, your differential is actually very much narrowed. It could either be toxoplasma, it could be Bechet's, it could be a part of neuroretinitis or lymphoma. I won't, in fact, even keep these two. It could be mostly toxo or Bechet's. When you see a diffuse lesions like this, this is mostly viral. So acute retinal necrosis, progressive outer retinal necrosis, CMV retinitis, syphilis very rarely, and toxo, this kind of presentation occurs only, the diffuse presentation, I mean, only in HIV patients, not in uh, immunocompetent patients. So once you have the phenotype, then you go on to multimodal imaging. In multimodal imaging, you should look, what is the site of involvement? What are the imaging biomarkers that could give you a possible clue towards etiology? some investigation, some radiology. So now with all this theoretical background, let's look at the cases and how can we apply this algorithm to posterior tuviatis. Now, this patient comes to you. So what are you looking at? You are looking at a yellowish white lesion, which looks like retinitis. There is media haze and probably there are vitreous cells. And you also have a scar sitting next to it. So what are the things which I said you should be looking for? The first was, is it chorioretinitis or retinochoroiditis? So it is primarily retinochoroiditis because you have headlight in the fog appearance. Uh, this is what it is. This is very classical headlight in the fog. Is it unilateral, bilateral? It is unilateral, it is focal. There is presence of associated vitreitis. There is no systemic disease, but look at it very classically. There is a scar next to it, so it is a satellite lesion. So now what do you have? You have a posterior uveitis with vitreitis, headlight in fog, satellite lesion. What are the conditions you can think of which would have this clinical presentation? Only one, and that is toxoplasmosis. So when you think of toxoplasmosis, what investigations <coughs> would you order? A clinical phenotype is strongest. The diagnosis is mostly clinical. Serology really does not have much role, but if 
you want to do maybe titles. OCT biomarkers are very important for making the diagnosis of uh, toxo, and I will show you. You do not need any investigations here or any pars planar vitrectomy. Uh, pars planar vitrectomy is only for the very complex cases where you don't have straightforward diagnosis of toxo. You want to do PCR or something, but not in a garden variety like this. Now you do OCT. And when you do OCT, it is very important that you do not have the OCT just passing through the fovea. You have to have OCT which is passing through the lesion. So what are the typical lesions that you see on toxoplasma? One, you will see these hyperreflective oval deposits on the inner surface of retina. You may have hyperreflective round shaped deposits on the posterior hyoid. And very interestingly, you will have the mirror image on the retinal surface. You may have retrohyloid hyperreflective dots. And it's very important if ever you are confused with toxo and viral. The toxo is always retinochoroiditis. So you will have retina and you will have underlying choroidal involvement, which does not happen in viral. So a simple OCT, which is generally available now, most of the practices and your clinical acumen, you can make the diagnosis of toxoplasmosis. And once you have the clinical diagnosis, start the patient on treatment because honestly, you do not need to wait for any unnecessary investigations. Now we come to the second leg, which is multifocal retinitis. Now you have a lesion like this, you have retinitis patches, you can see multiple patches here. Is it, what is it? It is retinitis. This disease is bilateral. Is it focal or diffuse? It is multifocal. Do you have associated vitreitis? Not much. Any systemic disease? Yes. He has oral ulcers and arthalgia. We do not yet have healing pattern. So what is the disease? Bilateral retinitis, multifocal with oral ulcers and arthalgia. What would you think of? You would not think of anything other than Betchett's. You cannot think of toxo, you cannot think because that does not fit into the clinical description. So if you're thinking of Betchett's, what is the next investigation to do? Any PG would want to chip in, welcome anytime. So if you're thinking of Betchett's, what would you like to do next? Well? We can go for, uh, can go for HLA B27 testing and we can also check for any associated other systemic conditions, uh, something like inflammatory bowel disease and others might be ruled out. Uh, the first one you said was HLA B27. Uh, from the HLAB markers, yes. HLA markers, B5152. B51, yes. Yeah, but you know, Betchitz is a kind of a emergency when you are seeing these lesions of retinitis. If you order HLA, it will take about two to three weeks for the report to come. Though it's a good idea to have HLA, I'm not denying it, uh, but you know, more than that, you want to look at the fluorescing because the fluorescent pattern of Betchitz is very characteristic and you want to know about the history and the rheumatology opinion because if you know diagnostic criteria of Betchitz, they are all clinical. HLA is not even in the diagnostic criteria, okay? So let's now see what we will do. Clinical phenotype is strongly suggestive of Betchitz. You agree? History taking is very crucial. Serology, no. Maybe HLA typing, but that's not something you will wait for the results to come. Now you want to look at the FFA biomarkers. Unlike uh, TOXO, where OCT is very important, in Betchitz, the pattern of FFA is very important. You don't want to do any radiology or any sampling. Now the typical Betchitz disease, 
the cystic patch of the retinitis, which I was showing you, which is becoming hyper in the late phase, but you have a diffuse leakage, which is happening from the capillary bed. And this is called fern-like leakage pattern, okay? And important in bedsheets is that you will see the leakage, which is diffuse, and which will also be away from the site of retinitis. This you will not see in Toxo. Toxo will not have a diffuse leak even if you decide to do the angiogram. It will show you focal lesion. Sometimes there are arteriolar plaques uh, which are called cryolysis arthritis, but you will not have the diffuse fern-like leakage like you have in retinitis of Betches. Is that clear? So now uh, we know the disease meets the clinical criteria for Betches and honestly, no investigation is required. We come to, we, treat, we, we dealt with focal, which was toxo, multifocal retinitis, which was Betches. Now we come to the next leg, which is diffuse retinitis. So this is a patient with diffuse retinitis. It's a 52-year-old, first episode, HIV is negative. So again, we come back to our same questions. Is it retinitis or choroiditis? If you look at it carefully, this is not truly retinitis because you see the vessels are actually going very nicely over it and it is diffuse. Could it be choroiditis? This is not choroiditis either because choroid has an anatomy and I'm sure all of you have read about that anatomy, which is that you can have either focal choroiditis, these are lobules. So you do not have a choroiditis lesions extending linearly like this. So when you have lesions like this, which you can subsequently confirm on OCT, these are subretinal deposits. It's a unilateral disease. It is a diffuse disease. There is no associated inflammation, no pigmentary, uh, no systemic disease, but there are few pigmentary lesions which you see in the phobia. Any guesses? What would be your differential diagnosis here? for diffuse retinitis, anyone? You can all, uh, you know, be on video, Pravati, and uh, that is Satyabrata and all the PGs. So any guesses what you would like to rule out here? Pravati? Other viral uh, absolutely viral would be very high on parts. Okay. It could be toxo, but 52 years old and subretinal deposits. You will also have to keep lymphomas in mind. So what do you do? First, before you do anything else, do OCT. And and pages, please be on video. All pages, please be on video. I don't think you should be turn off the video videos. Be interactive. It is for you. So if you pass the OCT through the lesions, that is the most important thing. Because when you send your OCT to the technician, they will always pass it through the fovea. But you do not want to see fovea. You want to see what is happening at what level the lesion is. And when we see, look at this OCT carefully. This is rounded roof configuration. You see this here. What I showed you in Toxo was oval deposits, mirror images, and involvement of underlying choroid to be repetitive. But here you have the involvement of the retina. There are no cells. It is rounded roof configuration. And along with it, uh, you have subretinal infiltrates. Now, these subretinal infiltrates, like you see, this is the infiltrate which we have done OCT. They are in the subretinal space. 
and you cannot have them in toxo or even in viral. So when you look at this OCT, even before you do anything else, you also have the disorganization of inner layers, which is not very important, but these are the biomarkers for lymphoma. That is rounded roof configuration, disorganization of layer involved, with posterior shadowing and subretinal and sub RTE infiltrates. So, if you have something like this, please do not start the patient on corticosteroids because the moment you start patient on corticosteroid, the lymphoma starts responding and the diagnosis is really delayed because lymphomas respond to corticosteroids to begin with. And even when you refer it to Soumya or to uh, Amitabh or anybody and they do biopsy, they will not find anything because you have by mistake started the corticosteroid. So they will have to stop corticosteroid and wait for 14 days before they can do biopsy. So it's very important that anything which is unusual or you are suspecting masquerades, uh, please get help. Now, Talking a little bit about lymphoma, these lesions may be very discreet, multifocal, subretinal deposits, and you may not actually see anything initially, but don't give up on the patient. If you're suspecting something unusual, uh, follow-up also becomes very important in posterior uveitis. So this is a 60-year-old lady. She complained of some cloudiness. You know, to me, initially when I saw her, to me, to be very honest with you, she looked almost normal, but she did have vitreitis and fluorescein showed some pattern, which I thought it could be lymphoma. And these deposits, very small at that point of time, but we did her MRI. Her MRI was normal, but if you look at the autofluorescence, this has this pattern, which should not be missed. And this is the pattern, which is for lymphoma. So, you know, subsequently she developed a lot of vitreitis and we did go in and she came out to be mid-88 positive, which is the genetic thing for lymphoma and she developed CNS lymphoma. So you can imagine that if you are careful, if you suspect it at the proper time, it's not only the eye, you can diagnose the CNS disease and you can save the life of the patient because you diagnosed it right. These are the other patterns of lymphoma, which can have these yellowish white subretinal deposits. So anything which is not coronitis, which is not retinitis, which is in the subretinal space, the first stage of presentation is 50 or above most of the times. There is vitreitis and there are no synechae. That is very important. Think of masquerades and lymphomas at the top of the masquerades. Get an autofluorescence done. If you see a pattern like this, this is called leopard skin pattern and it is very, very typical for lymphoma. Anybody would like to tell me what sign I just mentioned in lymphoma, the OCT? Anyone? Pragati? I just said... So rounded roof is something which will help you differentiate lymphoma from viral. Okay, these are the cases you should get MRI, which is biopsy, or refer it to the eye center. The diffuse retinitis that we see another variety which is more common. So so far we have dealt focal, multifocal, then we dealt with subretinal, which was lymphoma actually. And now we come to the diffuse retinitis through the hazy media. But what is so typical about these lesions? Uh, what do you see? Anaita, can you tell me what is the shape of these lesions? This is the shape. These are tongue shaped. Okay, these are like the projection. So if you have these lesions in the periphery, which are tongue-shaped lesion, this is very, very typical for viral. And if you are thinking of viral, which is herpes, acute retinal necrosis, 
Don't wait for anything. Start antiviral treatment. Even if you overtreat it, it's okay. Don't wait for any investigations before you start any treatment. So diffuse retinitis, clear media. This is a spot diagnosis. What is it? Low CD4 count, infraretinal hemorrhages, brush fire appearance, clear media. So what do you think it is? Anyone? Pragati, we come to you. Uh, HIV retinitis. Huh? Absolutely, this is CMV. Mm -hmm. so HIV has to be ruled out in these patients, but it is the opportunistic infections in HIV, which is CMV. And CMV is very typical. You remember this appearance. You have a granular appearance. It grows along the blood vessels. You would have hemorrhages on top of the yellowish granularity, brush fire appearance, fovea is generally spared, and vitritis is minimal. This is CMV retinitis, okay? Now, this is slightly difficult. Again, it is a diffuse retinitis, and you have a scar here, and it is in the posterior pole. And when you do OCT, you know, what you see, uh, you, you again see the, there are no oval deposits that I showed you in toxoplasma, but the posterior hyaloid appears thickened and, you know, there are some deposits and there is vitreitis. So what we think at this point of time, this is the OCT in toxoplasma, and this is the OCT in viral. If it is toxoplasma, you will have choroid involvement. If there is viral, there is generally no uh, choroidal involvement. So sometimes you may uh, need to do the OCT or other investigations to look at the etiology. And if that does not help, you go on with the analysis of the fluid and PCRs. I told you about the OCT, but then autofluorescence is very important for some RPE disturbances. Now I will show you a very interesting case. This is a child who is diagnosed with IgG4 disease and he comes and maybe I would have shown it in some previous meetings also. Now, from the patterns that I have showed you, do you think, this looks like retinitis, just say yes or no. Say anything. Does it look like retinitis to you? Yes, Pragati, does it look like retinitis? No, ma'am. Oh, wonderful. Does it look like choroiditis to you? Yes, ma'am. It looks like choroiditis to you. Okay. So we do autofluorescence. Autofluorescence shows these linear lesions. Now, could choroid have a linear form of choroiditis? No, isn't it? So it's probably not choroiditis also. The patient has IgG4 disease. So what is it? We did the OCT. There is no choroiditis here. What you see is the hyperreflective pillar-like septa like things which are going through the outer retina. Can you see them? But this is the pattern which is neither of retinitis nor of choroiditis. So, you know, talk to the patient, ask him the history. And this is very typical for laser burns. So the patient gave history of using laser in uh, like he had gone to Goa and he was playing with those <laughs> uh, from the Chinese market and these are the laser burns. So you have to look at the imaging to find out what you are dealing with because he had IgG4 disease. So somebody had suggested biologic therapy for the eye. So, but again, we come to how important the phenotype is. 
Now, this is RPE could get involved post fever. You see these subtle lesions and then you do autofluorescence and you find this. This is PPCRA. Uh, no further investigations are required for this one. Sometimes you will have the extension of the retinitis lesion into vitreous. That's not you see every day, but this is the patient who had suffered from dengue. I thought it was dengue foveolitis. Till the time we saw that there was burst of the cells from the retina into the vitreous. Now, this is the sign which is called rain cloud sign. If you see it, it is end of helmite. And the second thing to remember in endophthalmitis is if ever in uveitis you are seeing the yellow glow, it's not uveitis. Uveitis does not produce yellow glow. Yellow glow would mean endophthalmitis. So these are the patients you should go in. This patient was actually candida endophthalmitis. Take the vitreous sample and manage it as endophthalmitis. So we are done with retinitis and the next 15 minutes for retinitis. Dr. Vishali, can I interrupt you here? Yeah. So, uh, I, I, yeah. so I, I thought, you know, we, we could just look back at what we just heard from you. I think this is probably the best discussion on uh, coroditis and retinitis that you could hear anywhere in the world. So I hope you, all of you are listening very, very carefully to what we have just heard. And I have learned a lot of new things uh, from the last 15 minutes of discussion. So, you know, two things that come out very, very uh, clearly from this discussion are that the diagnosis of uveitis is not based on lab investigations. Lab investigations are only ancillary. The primary focus should be on picking up the clinical signs. And when you start off with a clinical science, the first thing to do is to make sure that you are dealing with uveitis and not a non-uveitic entity. I think the case on lymphoma that you saw, which could have been easily mistaken for a viral retinitis, is, is the best example to tell you that first be sure that you're dealing with uveitis. And once you know it's uveitis, and in this case, since we're dealing with posterior segment in inflammation, it will be very important to rule out whether it's retinitis or choroiditis. Because retinitis, as you saw, except those two uh, patterns, one of Bechet's disease and the other of lymphoma, everything else in retinitis is an infection. And all these infections are picked up on clinical pattern recognition. So if you can make out this diagnosis that it's a retinitis and a non Bechet's retinitis, then you can start the specific antimicrobial therapy immediately. These patients are not going to respond to corticosteroids. In fact, they will worsen with steroids. So you have to start with uh, and the appropriate antimicrobial uh, immediately. So if, if you can remember these points that the diagnosis is based on clinical pattern recognition, number one, the number two point is that most of these retinitis lesions are infections and require specific antimicrobial therapy. And the third point is that these diagnoses do not depend, except for syphilis, they do not depend on lab investigations. So if you remember these three points, I think that that would be very useful. Thank you, Dr. Vishali. I, I think we could move on uh, to choroiditis now. Time permits, we move on. Otherwise, we can just have the panel at this point also. Uh, Dr. Subhuti, can, can you can move us. on, uh, Vishali? Uh, only, you. only suggestion I would uh, tell you is uh, involve the postgraduates. They are uh, totally video off and uh, audio off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you should involve them. Otherwise, the very purpose is getting defeated. Dr. Devasis, Dr. Madhurima, Ayantika, Dr. Ayantika, please do come with the video. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Ma'am, uh, how useful is OCT for uh, looking at the choroid per se? When we 
we have the facility of doing uh, enhanced depth imaging on OCTs that we have these days. So are there any cues uh, on OCT or some biomarkers, particularly of choroid, that we could utilize in diagnosis or maybe narrowing down the diagnosis further? Yes, OCT is very important uh, because uh, most of the uveitis is coming from the choroid. So it is a primary site of involvement for all choroiditis. So when we are looking at VKH disease, monitor the thickness of the choroid on OCT and even when the disease rectors, sometimes the thickness of the choroid is the first thing which increases even before the other clinical signs become apparent. Second is the granulomas. You can have granulomas in, you can have in sarcoidosis. The TB granulomas tend to be large, single, and you can see the elevation of the choroid with changes on in the outer retina. Whereas the sarcoid granulomas are small, multiple in this coma, and they do not produce changes in the outer retina. And the third is the presence of choroidal neovascularization, which could be a complication of any choroiditis for which OCT is very helpful. Besides this, there are markers like hyperreflective dots and other things, choroidal vascularity index and all those things, which at the level of PG, really they do not matter, or even at the level of practicing the new Dr. Devasis, do you have any questions on the talk given so far? You are muted. Anything, Madhurima? Uh, Madhurima, you are muted. Madhurima, you are muted. Please unmute yourself. Sorry. Uh, Ma'am, I was thinking, could you tell us something about the chorioretinopathy? Like you were telling about retinochoroiditis. Where we see, where we see uh, things like uh, white dot syndromes and uh, birdshot chorioretinopathy. If you could tell us something about these, ma'am, please. Yeah, I'm coming to choroid. Birdshot somehow we do not see in India. So, but the other white dots are how to approach choroid. I'm coming. Okay, thank you. Let's go to right now. So you all have to be actively involved. Otherwise, Dr. Babu is going to score D for that. So you have to be is actually, as I said, is it choroiditis, retinochoroiditis? Then you also see is optic nerve involved? Are the vessels involved? Does it fit into any known features of infection, non-infection? The similar thing is it unifocal, multifocal, unilateral, bilateral. Any is what was the previous episode like, and is it responding the way it should? This is a general algorithm for choroiditis. Choroiditis can be diffuse, it can be multiple. If it is diffuse, it can be retinochoroiditis, and I just told you that retinochoroiditis would be a part of toxo and viral, which is mostly retinitis, and you do not have a very minimal choroidal involvement. Has any one of you seen patients with retinous choroiditis? You were asked, have you seen with cervigenous choroiditis? Pragati? Uh, one case of active toxo I have seen, ma'am. You have seen toxo. Toxo is retinitis, okay? Serpage is the pure form of it. Okay, no problem. And serpage is, I will show you later on how it shows. And Madhurika, you were asking about white dot. 
the multi focus for the diet mean one is apm ppe one is multiple evanescent white dot syndrome and the third one is pip i think for you you do not need to know the atypical phenotypes and all that's not for students will really. can any one of you look at the top tell me what do you think it is it's a book picture taken from don gas so what do you think it is showing retinitis or choroiditis 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 it's showing choroiditis is it unifocal or multifocal multifocal multifocal, multifocal. absolutely brilliant what is fluorescein showing फॉर्मली हाइपर ओके so this is apm ppe now we look at this what do you think it is retinitis choroiditis choroiditis what is the pattern of the choroiditis what do you see where is it healing and where is it active healing in the peripheral areas and more active in the center healing in the center you see these pigmentary changes so it's healing in the center and yellowish elevated edge this is active right anything which is healing becomes flat becomes pigmented and you see under like choroidal vessel anything which is active would have a yellowish edge what do you see here on fluorescein debesis can you comment on the fluorescein yeah please go on ffa ffa if you see here you see mixed fluorescence is that right yes. what is happening to the edge edge is hypo hypo and when you see in the late phase it is hyper oh. so what does it mean it means there is a disease which is healing in the center and along the edge and it is geographic kind of serpiginous kind what is serpiginous serpiginous is like a growing serpentine fashion like this okay so the disease is active here this is what is serpiginous choroiditis okay for all of those who haven't seen this is serpiginous choroiditis and once we see this picture in classical we will see that it is autoimmune but in india and other countries tb as an etiology needs to be ruled there is a placoid kind of lesion okay and this is what is called ground glass appearance no dark appearance either hyper this is needs to be hyper at the edges this whole thing is becoming ground glass and glass appearance is very typical for syphilis i think i'm not going to go too much into this uh so i would love to answer any questions and this is the last case probably i will show like so highlighted how important it is to know the phenotype you know there is a diffuse retinitis can you all pick out what is the pigment here we actually did the vitrectomy and found the toxocyst but when patient got his previous pictures what is it showing okay yes Yeah, yeah. Go on. Area of retinitis with headlight and fog. Yes. You, yes. So if you can catch headlight. that is a certain this fog that when you see this phenotype, this toxo, if you recognize, if patient 
steroids. This is what happens. Okay. So it's very important that any posterior uveitis that you see do not only start steroids. That is what Soumya was trying to tell you. That condition. That if you there for people know what you are. You are thinking of toxo and you are treating with anti-toxo antibiotics, it is absolutely missing on toxo and giving the steroids, it is Shali, yes, sir. When we see that a picture like that, you should also uh, consider the you know competency of the patient. Especially. This is the classical serpiginous, which is pseudopodia like from the disc, which we do not see very commonly in India. Uh, we generally see the other variety, which is serpiginous like. But this is the classical book picture. If you ever see it grows along this. Uh, yeah, I think I'll stop here because. I would love to answer the questions that you might have.